Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm J.R. Haywood, Assistant Vice President for Regulatory Affairs, and it's my distinct uh, pleasure and honor to introduce our Washington powerhouse uh, team here this afternoon. Jennifer Zeitzer, from, uh, who's the Director of Legislative Relations at Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology, and our own Sarah Walter, the Associate Vice uh, President for Governmental Affairs at MSU. She's based in the Washington office. Um, both of these ladies are deeply entrenched in uh, Washington uh, governmental activities, and I learn a lot every time I talk with them. So I'm delighted that they uh, could join us here today. So first, Jennifer, I think, is going to lead off. I'm going to start off today by providing a little bit of an overview of what's <coughs> happening in Washington today. So uh, to get started, um, current environment in D.C., if you have watch cable news lately or glance at a headline of a newspaper or follow anything on Twitter, you might come up with the conclusion that Congress is a hopeless, disorganized, dysfunctional mess, loathed by the American public, less popular than head lice, um, not even you know, members of their own family like members of Congress. You would not be entirely wrong if you reached that conclusion and the media really likes to print stories and run a lot of things that would ha have you believe that. Um, if you had a front row seat to wa what's really happening in Washington, you might get a slightly different perspective. Uh, and believe it or not, um, they are trying now. Some would argue that Congress had nowhere to go but up because they hit rock bottom in 2013 when they shut down the government. And that was not a proud moment for anyone, even members of Congress. And so they really have been trying to get their act together. Um, there's a kind of a new set of leaders in town if you remember last fall, there was a little bit of drama in the House of Representatives with the retirement and stepping down of Speaker John Boehner. He was replaced by uh, Paul Ryan of Wisconsin. Uh, new Senate leadership as well, too. So um, Speaker Ryan and his counterpart in the Senate, uh, Mitch McConnell from Kentucky, have really been focused on governing, doing the job that Congress was elected to do, and which, quite frankly, the Constitution envisioned for them. Uh, and what they've been trying to do is deal with some unrest, particularly in the House of Representatives. Um, the House kind of gets a bum rap. I mean, there are more of them, so more opportunities for dysfunction. But Speaker Ryan and Majority Leader McConnell have been very focused on trying to deal with that. And one of the things that they've tried to do is kind of get back to what they call regular order, which is legislation comes through the committees, is considered by committees before it ever gets to the full House or the full Senate for a vote. And that's a really important distinction between the old way of doing things where legislation sometimes made it to the floor of the House or Senate, had never been considered in committee, it was the first time anyone saw it. And so there was a lot of pushback. Um, despite what you might think, there actually is a willingness on the part of the leadership to compromise in order to accomplish goals. Taking these hardline positions when you don't have an absolute majority in the House or the Senate, and quite frankly, you have a president of the different party in the White House who has the very, very powerful tool of the veto pen. Compromise is inevitable at some point in the process. And um, the new leadership has made it very clear that the last government shutdown didn't really give them much except for a bunch of negative headlines. So we will not be having any more conversations right now about shutting down the government. Now, come this fall, as we get closer to the election, that may come back into play. But for now, the party line in Washington is we are not shutting down the government. Um, last fall was actually a pretty productive time for Congress, despite themselves. Uh, in October, they ended a, about nine months of fighting over the budget, and they passed a piece of legislation called the Bipartisan Budget Act. And it was really intended to just stop all the sniping and fighting back and forth about the budget and kind of get everybody on the same page about spending and priorities. And so Congress passed this. Um, the president signed it very quickly in October of 2015, and it accomplished two really important goals. Um, the first was raise the Budget Control Act spending caps. So Going back to 2011, which is when the budget fights really started in earnest, uh, Congress did pass a piece of legislation that year that for the first time since, I think, the 1970s, actually, finally sort of cut up the federal credit card and put Congress on a pretty strict spending diet. Um, it was intended to be a draconian process. It was intended to force Congress to make difficult decisions. But at the same time, it was somewhat unrealistic because Given the current environment and what's happening and you know, things happening around the world and questions about our national security, the numbers were somewhat unrealistic to what they could actually implement in the end. And so these Budget Control Act caps look great on paper, but in reality, they're very difficult to live with. And so 
twice now since 2011, Congress has raised those caps. And this, the most recent time was in October. And it's a two-year deal, raised them for 2016 and 2017. And what we're talking about right now on today, March 7th, is the 2017 budget. The 2016 budget was actually passed in December and signed by the president. The agencies are now in the process of spending that money. The 2017 budget really begins on October 1 of this year. Um, which is con inconveniently one month before the big presidential election. So now Sarah's going to talk a little bit about what that might mean. Um, <coughs> the other important thing that the, bu the Bipartisan Budget Act really did in, in October was removed for the time being this threat of sequestration, the horrible automatic spending cuts that have only really been implemented once in 2013 that were terrible. If you remember that or you applied for a grant from NIH around that time, NIH's budget overnight got cut by 5%. And NIH had very little say in how that cut. It was an across the board, slash and burn everything at all the institutes and centers to get to that level. So for now, we don't have to worry about this terrible word and process until 2018. It's a nightmare for me and Sarah for the moment, but for now, you know, we can sleep well at night. Unfortunately, not everybody got the memo that the Bipartisan Budget Act was supposed to provide a ceasefire in these budget wars. Um, to be fair, uh, the the most fiscally conservative block of members of the House of Representatives um, did not like that budget deal at all. In fact, only 79 House Republicans voted for it. It passed and became law with the help of Democrats and more moderate Republicans. But that's it, that most of the House of Representatives did not like that deal. Um, it was negotiated by Speaker Boehner on his way out the door, so they felt even less compelled to support it since they helped overthrow the Speaker. Uh, and now the House Freedom Caucus and the Republican Study Group, this is the faction within the House that's the most fiscally conservative, they, are, they have been spending the last couple of weeks attempting to renegotiate that deal. What they really hate about is that it raised those spending caps. The very thing that helped get a $2 billion increase for NIH in December is what drove them crazy. We're going to be spending more money. And so they are currently fighting with the leadership of the House about what to do about that. Um, and for the moment, it's delaying the next part of the process, which is the appropriations process, which is really how the decisions get made about how money gets spent and how much each agency will get for its budget for the next fiscal year. So we still have a little bit of the mood of dysfunction that we had a couple of years ago, although I'm hoping that it will get worked out within the next couple of weeks. Um, in terms of the appropriations outlet, Outlook, that's really where the rubber hits the road money-wise. Um, how does, who makes the decision for how much money NIH gets? Um, it's through a very laborious process. Um, there are 12 individual appropriations bills that must get passed every year. So automatically you're starting from a very difficult threshold. You know, passing legislation is something that Congress is not super good at right now. And if you ask them to pass 12 different spending bills, it's complicated. It's difficult enough that they haven't accomplished this since 1994. Um, so we've been dealing with these budget issues for a while. Um, it would be difficult in a non-election year when Congress is focused and they're not worried about having to take difficult votes to get reelected or being on the campaign trail or raising money. But it's an even bigger challenge this year. Um, again, we have an election coming up. But the congressional schedule is pretty light. Um, it's the equivalent of taking a light course load as a, gr a graduate or undergraduate student. Um, the summer break this year is seven weeks. It's July 18th through Labor Day. So Congress will not be in Washington. They will be home darkening your doorsteps and running for re-election. Um, they are also planning to wrap up the part of their business um, by October 1 so they can go home and campaign again. And for now, not planning to come back until November 14th, you know, get through Election Day. Um, it is inevitable that they're going to have to do what's called a lame duck session at the end of the year between late November and Christmas time. Uh, it's going to be a very busy point of time. Uh, so trying to pass all this legislation under a compressed schedule is already raising the degree of difficulty quite a bit. But on the plus side, um, I'm an optimist, a glass half full kind of girl. Um, the good news is that the leadership really thinks it's very important for Congress to focus on the appropriations process. And so Mitch McConnell has already agreed that if they can get those appropriation bills through the committees, they will bring them to the Senate floor for votes. This would be a big shift because not one single appropriations bill went to the Senate floor last year. So that's already that's a big change. Um, the second thing uh, is Democrats in the Senate are promising for now to behave themselves. Last year, the Dem part of the reason the Senate never considered a single funding bill last year was because the Senate Democrats blocked every single one of them from moving forward. And they did so because they were really unhappy that they had, there was no budget deal. 
once the budget deal got in place and was signed into law, then they started cooperating. But for now, the Democrats are pledging to go along with the process and not stand in the way. One thing that may change that calculus is the current debate over whether or not the Senate will consider a Supreme Court nominee to replace Antonin Scalia. That fight could, unfortunately, sort of spoil the atmosphere and the environment for the rest of us who don't really care that much about the Supreme Court and just want to see NIH and NSF get funded. Um, another somewhat challenge is the spending cap. Remember I said they were raised? The raise for 2017 wasn't all that generous. On the domestic discretionary side, i.e. NIH and NSF, there's only an additional $15 billion to go around, which sounds like a lot of money until you go to Washington and that, doesn't, that buys you about 10 minutes in Washington. So there's already gonna be a, a pretty big fight over how to divide the pie again this year. To be fair, there is an additional $15 billion on the defense side as well too. But for the agencies that fund a lot of the buildings around here, it's not a lot of money. Um, that being said, NIH is extremely popular on Capitol Hill right now. Members of Congress finally are getting the message that continuing to starve the NIH budget is not a way to buy nice things like better cancer research and a cancer moonshot in precision medicine. So as an advocacy organization and community, what we're trying to do is capitalize on that momentum to make sure that while Congress still cares, <laughs> that they do as, what, as much as they can for NIH, and NSF for that matter, and DOE, it's not just NIH. Um, I wanted to introduce a new topic uh, because it's become a real important side conversation right now among the appropriations and budget committees, and that's this idea of mandatory versus discretionary funding. Um, this is a super nerdy topic, so I'm gonna try not to go too far into the weeds on it, but it's important. Uh, right now, Funding for science and the science agencies is funded out of what's called the discretionary part of the budget. It is the smallest part of the budget. But there is a conversation taking place that the discretionary budget is what's being squeezed. So what if we just moved all the funding for science onto the mandatory side of the budget, because that's where the money is. So in thinking about mandatory versus discretionary spending, mandatory spending represents about 81% of the total federal budget. So why not go to the bigger pot? Um, it's easier said than done. Um, technically, mandatory spending is, I call it unlimited because there really is no cap on that, whereas the discretionary budget is subjected to those Budget Control Act caps that I mentioned a little while ago. Um, this is where the Appropriations Committee comes in. Uh, appropriators have very little say over how the mandatory budget gets spent. It's, you know, people are eligible for programs, the money gets spent on things like Pell Grant and Medicare and Social Security. On the other side, um, on the discretionary side, the appropriators have a lot of control and they can say, you know what, we think NIH is so important, it needs to be a top priority, so we're gonna park a whole lot of money there or NSF or DOE. Uh, and so what's going on right now is whether or not it makes sense to shift all the science funding to the mandatory side of the budget. Uh, I don't know that that's gonna get resolved this year, um, but it is something that's happening as a way, it's a reaction to the fact that these spending caps are so tight that it doesn't really allow for anything to become a priority. Um, if you think about, this is the way we look at it visually in terms of the budget, you know, the majority of the budget goes towards these sort of mandatory programs and interest on the national debt. One thing I like to point out, especially when I'm visiting a member of Congress's office that says things like, spending is out of control in Washington, we have to cut. Uh, spending on science and medical research represents 2% of our federal budget. So it is not NSF and NIH that are causing the budget deficit right now. Um, it's an important point, uh, and sometimes what you have to make to those folks who don't really know, even though they're members of Congress, where the money goes. So this is one of my favorite little charts, courtesy of the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, just kind of help educate at a very you know, basic level. Um, Sarah had asked me to talk a little bit too about things that are just sort of what I call the non-money side. So uh, appropriate, appropriations legislation is clearly what we worry about because that's where all the money comes from. But Congress also sometimes will do what's called authorizing legislation. That's sort of the policy side of things. These broad policy statements or these broadly focused bills that think about something besides money. They often come with an authority to spend money, but it is ultimately only the appropriators who can decide what money gets spent and how it gets spent. So there's a number of bills that are pending. Um, most of them have something to do with NIH funding, as I mentioned earlier. Just a very big awareness of what's happening in the medical research field, such promise at a time when the budget is pretty crunched. And so I don't know that any of these particular bills have much chance of actually making it to the president's desk, but it's nice that they've been introduced. 
and we'll certainly keep an eye on them. Um, the newest one that just made it out of the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee is this Next Generation Researchers Act, and it's really an attempt to consolidate and support everything that NIH is doing right now to help younger investigators and newer investigators compete for funding. Um, and then <coughs> also an important provision in there to expand NIH's existing um, loan repayment programs for people who go into biomedical research, uh, raising the cap on what can be reimbursed and also giving NIH the authority to expand those programs into new and emerging areas of science that might not be covered right now. So um, hopefully some of these bills will become law. We'll see. Uh, and then before I finish up, I wanted to cover two other kind of parallel efforts that are going on at the same time. You may have heard, um, and if you're a Michigander, you should have, the 21st Century Cures Act, um, sponsored by Representative Fred Upton and uh, his count Democratic counterpart, Diana DeGette. Um, Chairman Upton has been all over this state and all over the country talking about this comprehensive piece of legislation. Um, it was actually passed by the House of Representatives last summer in a very overwhelmingly bipartisan vote of 344 to 77. Um, and what it, it's a huge bill, it's about 200, 250 pages. Uh, one of the most important provisions in there is that it authorizes annual increases in NIH's overall budget. So it says to the appropriators, we believe that NIH should continue, its budget should continue to grow, and you should find the money in your limited allocation to do that. Um, uh, it envisions a path forward from 2016 to 2018, so somewhat temporary. And it uses a combination, going back to this conversation about discretionary versus mandatory funding, to how to get to those big increases for NIH. Uh, there is a little bit of a trick, and you have to learn in any piece of legislation to read the fine print. The fine print is that the new mandatory funding would be restricted to um, some very specific projects, development of new cures, um, accelerating advancement, this high-risk, high-reward research, and support for early career researchers, so somewhat targeted. Um, I think as a scientist, especially someone who might be dependent on federal funding, you don't care where the money comes from as long as the check clears or the electronic funds go through <laughs> safely. Uh, and that's one thing that we're dealing with now on Capitol Hill that from a scientific perspective. As long as the money is coming and it's stable and predictable and we know what the budget's going to be from year to year, pull it from any pot that you want. Uh, it's just a matter of making sure that we don't do what we did to the NIH budget after 2003, which is a steady upward climb and then a sharp decline. We are trying to avoid that. Um, other key provisions of this bill, streamlining clinical trials, bringing the FDA into a much more modern viewpoint of how they do things. Uh, advancing personalized medicine, um, and then, you know, the ever-increasing search for uh, drugs for rare diseases. So a pretty comprehensive policy bill, the first of its kind, really, since about 2006. I just have a question. Like, what is considered high-risk high That is an excellent question. Um, I would have to look at the definition from NIH, but kind of outside-the-box kinds of things that might not necessarily have gotten funding in the most recent climate. Uh, I don't. I don't have a specific example, but I can get back to you with that one. Taking a look at the legislation. I can give you examples. Oh, Thank you. Uh, not again. I, I'm with her. I can't give you the NIH definition, but there are uh, two agencies, uh, ARPA E and DARPA. One DARPA is for defense. ARPA E is for energy. There's also an agency in intelligence. There's also a small effort at education, all of which do this sort of research. It's it's not basic all the time. It can be basic, but it's it's really cutting edge, um, very rapid funding sometimes, um, but it's managed by program managers who have a keen sense of what they're looking for in specific areas. Um, so if you looked at DARPA and ARPA-E, you'd get a sense, at least from the energy and the defense sector, of, of what is what is cutting edge. Do I also understand from your slide that it would only be part of the mandatory budget for five years? Yes, temporary. And that is one of the concerns, that what happens after that money disappears. That's kind of what happened after 2003 when Congress stopped worrying about doubling the NIH budget. So something to be a little bit concerned about because what's going to happen after 2020? Will that mandatory money still be there or is NIH going to be back where it was? And, and so you're saying they're actually targeting specific areas, not divisions of NIH? Or right. Exactly, targeting specific areas and letting NIH decide how to do it. But it's it's risky, it, you know. For for FASA, we represent what I call the rank and file folks who live off of R O ones and do a lot of the very basic scientific research. That's a really important part of the enterprise. So when you see a bunch of money being sent to only specific buckets, it's a little bit concerning. Thank you.
when you talk about mandatory versus discretionary, does mandatory get increases? I mean, do I was trying to think where do you want to be? Or if you're in mandatory, is it a flat rate yearly and maybe that you don't want to Mandatory really depends on the legislation that, that, that would fuel it. So in this case, you'd get that $1.75 billion a year increase through 2020, and after that, it's anybody's guess. The bill, a new law would have to be passed after that. So it's, it's pretty risky. I mean, one could also argue that discretionary funding these days is pretty risky as well, too, since that keeps going up and down. So that's why we're sort of having this deep within ourselves conversation about what's better, mandatory funding or discretionary. While this bill passed the House fairly easily in the end, it went through a lot of revisions, and I must say that Chairman Upton and his counterpart, Diana Degat, really listened to the voices of the scientific community. The first iteration of the bill was kind of a mess and not super helpful, um, but the, the version that passed was much better. However, the Senate, being the Senate, has decided to take a slightly different approach. Um, so while the House was working on this 21st Century Cure bill, Cures Bill, the Committee of Jurisdiction in the Senate, which is the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, or HELP Committee, um, decided that they were going to do something very similar. They were not interested in passing the 21st Century Cures Act. It perhaps is a little bit of just the Senate ego there, but um, they took a different approach. And um, Lamar Alexander from Tennessee and Patty Murray from Washington uh, started leading an initiative. They also wanted to look at some of the same questions that drove the effort in the House, which is, you know, how can we support, what can we do to support more medical innovation? A lot of concern about drug costs, delivery, and the device process, and, and what's happening at FDA, that the current system at FDA doesn't really reflect the science that's available now. So the Senate spent most of last year kind of getting themselves ready to work on a big bill. Um, they released a white paper, kind of setting out some pretty lofty goals in January. Quietly behind the scenes, they formed these bipartisan working groups of members of the HELP Committee who met you know, behind closed doors for weeks and months at a time to try and reach an agreement on things. They held multiple hearings with every agency I can think of under the sun that might have an interest in this. They reached out to groups like FASIB and the scientific societies and said, give us your input and your feedback. What are the problems that we could solve with an, a, a big comprehensive bill? Uh, unfortunately, that effort has somewhat petered out a little bit. Um, in January of this year, uh, Chairman Alexander said that they were going to move forward, but they were not going to do it in a way that they had envisioned originally. Originally, they were going to produce one bill, like the 21st Century Cures Act. Um, they have now decided to break down their effort into separate pieces of legislation. And so on February 9th, they had the first session and they approved seven different bills focused on these areas. Um, they'd all been discussed at some point within this medical innovation initiative. Uh, on Wednesday of this week, they've got another session which they plan to approve a few more bills. Um, Zika is the new one that was added to the agenda for obvious reasons, and this bill is focused on developing vaccines for the Zika virus, which is already kind of underway at NIH. And then they're gonna have one more session in April I say vote on bills to be determined because it's not been determined which bills are going to be passed yet. So what they're going to do in the Senate is pass a whole series of pieces of legislation and then figure out what happens next. Do they sort of stitch that together into one bill and then pass something through the Senate, which would then be negotiated with the House? That's still kind of to be determined. And to be honest with you, I don't see that really happening much this year because of, again, the shortened schedule and the election and that kind of thing. But that being said, I'm encouraged that at least they're paying attention. Um, in an interesting development kind of related to this medical innovation initiative, and it is sponsored by all of the Democrats on the Senate Help Committee. Unfortunately, right now, it's a Democrat-only bill. No Republican has stepped forward and said they would support it. It does something very similar to some of these other bills, which is, would create um, a new stream of mandatory funding for NIH, again, time limited, except in this case, it would provide that funding through 2025 instead of 2020. Um, they said it would provide about $5 billion a year in new funding for both NIH and the FDA. Uh, the split between the NIH side of, the, of that and the FDA isn't quite worked out yet. They would rely a lot on the agencies, but I would suspect that the majority of the money would actually go towards NIH. Um, the trick with this bill is that it would only provide that mandatory funding if the discretionary budget went up or at least stayed flat. And that's an important distinction because the one thing that we do want to make sure is that Mandatory funding should not supplant discretionary funding. It should just supplement it. We don't want to accidentally wind up cutting the NIH budget or, or destabilizing it any further. 
And this is a really important distinction that this bill says there should be both discretionary and mandatory and that the only way you get the mandatory funding is, is if the appropriators continue to grow the budget because there is some concern on the appropriation side that if they know that there's another pot of money to tap, the appropriators will say, great, they'll, we'll take care of NIH out of that budget and we won't do anything else for them and we don't want to see that happen. Um, again, it was fine print um, and the, this new money, the mandatory money, would only be allowed to be used for these sort of select initiatives. Uh, so it's somewhat targeted. Question back. What is, do you know the definition of the early career scientists? Are they looking for Yes, I believe it's the 10 year mark, correct? Um, it's within the time of obtaining the career, uh, a degree or less significant Point. Yeah, I think it's within 10 years and then also the types of funding that you've had is also part of the definition. So if you've served as an independent PI on something that is even close to a research project grant, you're not early career anymore. Is it both, like 10 years or can that just be a PI? I'd have to go back to the original language. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's part of the, some of NIH's sort of ongoing initiatives. And it is, there is a distinction between the early career investigator and the new investigators as per the NIH definition as well, too. So well, we can go back and take a look and send some more information about that as well, too. Oh, thank you, Yvette. <laughs> so um, this bill was just introduced. We'll see what kind of future it has. But again, more attention to NIH. I'm just curious, like, why do lawmakers prioritize uh, places where they want to put the money in? rather than just let the NIH decide. Like they, they nominated, they selected the director, why don't they let him decide? For the most part, they have been, up until this point, trying to leave the science to the scientists and saying, you know, we'll just provide a pot of money, you figure out how it gets spent. What's happening is, in the last couple of years, NIH has had some big, what we call, priority projects, like the Precision Medicine Initiative. Now it's the Cancer Moonshot. But the NIH budget has been relatively flat. FY 2016 was the big difference. They got a $2 billion increase. So my sense is that this part of it is they want to provide a special pot of funding for these big projects so that they don't take money away from the investigator-initiated research pool. Um, the other thing, too, and Chairman Alexander has made this very clear, he doesn't want to just give NIH a bunch of money without some expectation of how it would be used. So it's an attempt to control that if there's new money to be provided, it's going to be for things that have already been identified in the president's budget as priorities. And that, quite frankly, are pretty popular on Capitol Hill. Who wouldn't love a cancer moonshot? Um, and who doesn't want to talk about, you know, improving diversity and things like that? So that's part of why they're kind of shifting from their strategic, the viewpoint that they used to have, which is let the scientists decide. Um, and that in this kind of thing. So we'll see what happens with it in the future, but there is some concern that these new initiatives are going to crowd out the existing money at NIH and provide less, wind up providing less for investigators in the end, and no one wants to see that happen. Actually, Jennifer, before you move on, I can, I can, it is Thank both. You. It's within 10 years okay. of terminal degree or medical residency and uh, has not been a PI on a competing uh, NIH RPG. Thank you so much for that clarification. I just figured might as well close that loop. Sorry, we worked together. Um, and then last but not least, uh, the role of FACIP here, I've got to do a little bit of PR. We put together, and I actually brought copies of these, which I'll leave in the back, a number of resources. Um, we started doing these fact sheets really to educate legislators about how much federal funding is coming to their state and their district from various agencies because we found that they were largely unaware. Um, I've been in meetings where aides have said, oh, yeah, my boss doesn't really support NIH funding because this district doesn't get any money which turns out to be false. Almost every congressional, every congressional district in the country gets money. So um, FASIP has a new series of fact sheets. Uh, we've put together sort of a state profile um, from uh, NIH, National Science Foundation, the Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Energy Office of Science, which those of you who work on this campus know that you get a lot of DOE money right now for a very special facility. Um, we've also put together sort of a state profile, you know, how much NIH funding comes to Michigan Oh, across the state, and then putting together uh, by di congressional district, so that in this case, Michigan's eighth district where you live, this is how much money is coming. Um, and we actually, these have been pretty popular uh, now, and I think they're presented in an easily, you know, visually appealing way. It's easy to pull the stats off there. We're flattered that Dr. Collins at NIH, when he does meetings on Capitol Hill, uses these as well too. Um, they. All the data on these fact sheets is from the federal agencies themselves. They just don't have the resources to sort of pull it all together like this. We also have two other fact sheets. Um, one, the value of biomedical research. 
I am still distressed that when I do meetings on Capitol Hill, I have aides and people say to me, you know what, if we cut the NIH budget, it's not that big a deal because the universities will make up the difference and the universities should be funding research. Um, so they need an education on where money comes from. Uh, in addition, um, they often like to say, well, the pharmaceutical industry should be, they should really be the ones funding the biomedical research in this country. So we have to educate there. Uh, and then last but not least, a really important issue to FASA, which I know is an important issue on this campus, which is the use of animals in research. Why do we use animals in biomedical research? Why is it necessary? What have animals contributed? We are still fighting a battle on Capitol Hill uh, from the animal rights activists who would love to see no research done on any animals whatsoever and have been very vocal about that in talking to members of Congress. So I will stop now and turn over to Sarah. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah Walter. I'm the Associate Vice President for Government Affairs at Michigan State University. I run the Michigan State University, Washington, D.C. office. I have a staff of two. I have an assistant director and I have a office manager. And we, uh, my assistant director and I, we cover the entire federal government for the university. We represent the interests and priorities of the MSU administration, um, which we'll go over this briefly. Um, a lot of folks uh, on campus, faculty, students, come to Washington working with their own associations. And we're delighted to hear that you're coming. We're delighted to be a home base. We're actually across the street from the Navy Yards Metro Center, and uh, about a 10, 12 minute walk to Capitol Hill. So uh, we'd like you to consider us a home away from home. And uh, today I'm just gonna give a sort of a, a broader overview uh, beyond uh, biomedical topics of priorities of MSU. I'm gonna talk a little bit before I go into my slides about state relations. We have, um, David Bertram is the Assistant VP of Government Affairs on campus. He covers all state relations down at the Capitol. Uh, last week, President Simon testified about the priorities of MSU um, at the state level. And then, of course, you know we're working very hard with um, the Flint government to do all that can be done to assist the citizens of Flint who are just going through a, a nightmare on a daily basis. So at the state level, we're working on that. We're also working at the federal level very closely with Dr. Uh, Mona, who I'm sure you all know, who was the, um, the uh, alarm giver for what's happening to the kids. At the federal level for Flint, uh, the House passed a bill that included EPA provisions. The Senate came up with an agreement that provided uh, increased access to loans and some health programs. That bill is being held up by a senator from Utah who does not quite think that there should be federal funds to Flint given that the state of Michigan this year has a surplus. And then given that these are two different bills, we'll see what happens at the very end. We've also, my office has been helping uh, Dr. Mona as she reaches out to NIH pursuing every opportunity that there, there is. So going forward. Um, just very quickly, as was mentioned, the President's Fiscal Year 17 budget came out in February. Like most budgets coming from the White House of the last year of a President's um, time, this is generally considered, as considered to be aspirational. It's the polite term for it. Uh, there are a lot of big initiatives proposed, but the President will be going on to other things at the end of the year, and most of these proposals are multi-year and it's, it really depends on who comes in and whether they want to continue any of these, these ideas. They also tend to be very high dollar amount, which given the current budget climate is sometimes difficult. Um, so once the budget request is proposed, budget resolutions are hopefully passed. The appropriations process starts. It would take, uh, negotiations would take place in the House and the Senate over the, the spring and summer. Uh, hopefully there won't be a deadlock, but most likely there will be a deadlock, and depending on the outcome of the President's budget, we will probably have uh, an end game, whether it's individual bills passed or another omnibus in the autumn or closer to Christmas. Uh, it's way too early to tell at this point. I'm not going to go into this, but this is the, the budget timeline. October 1 is, is truly aspirational. We've never, sorry. We used to pass appropriations bills, 
by October 1. It has been a very, very, very long time since we've ever achieved that goal. Again, uh, just talking about this is a, a gives you a sense of the, the different baselines of the different appropriations bills. Uh, this is the federal spending trends. And you can see the NIH is in the green and it's, it's uh, sloping downwards. Uh, NASA has sloped slightly up and uh, so has USDA research. And that's the total R&D uh, by agency, I should note DOD is mostly development, it is not mostly research. Uh, DOE, I'll talk a little bit about this. As you know, down the street we have a facility for rare isotope beams, which um, Michigan State University is building in cooperation and coordination with the Department of Energy. And just for this year, as you can see, most uh, agencies in the federal government receive proposed budget increases uh, with the exception of NASA, uh, some of the agencies in commerce, and uh, basic research at DOD took a hit. Sorry, uh, yep. Sarah, the, the legend there says it includes discretionary mandatory funding. What mandatory funding is there? About that would be the NIH. This is a proposal. This is the president's uh, proposal. So he proposes some mandatory increases. And one of that would be. So in the, in the budget, for example, that we're currently working with. Yeah. Uh, what agencies receive mandatory? Fiscal year 16, um, not many. This is all a new, brand new area. I see. I didn't realize that the president's budget also has a piece of NIH funding and mandatory. And NSF as well. So mm -hmm. this, this fight over mandatory versus discretionary spending, the White House has jumped into the fray as well and said, oh, we'd like to do a lot of extra things at NSF and DOE, and the 2017 Obama proposal includes both mandatory and discretionary funding for NIH, NSF, and DOE. I know, I forget, there's a couple other agencies. The same thing of uh, picking out certain areas. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. very much so. So uh, with DOE in particular, there's a um, Millennium Initiative, I think it's called, that um, addresses clean energy and climate change, which, as you know, is not <laughs> topics that would be popular with the current co Congress. So, uh, unfortunately, much of the mandatory spending is in politically tinged areas that may not see the light of day at the end of this. So, quickly, these are White House budget request priorities for fiscal year 17. I've picked out a few of these that are, uh, correspond with priorities of Michigan State University. Uh, agriculture research, I should point out the White House recommends doubling of the Agriculture and Food Research Initiative budget. We'll certainly be advocating for this. It's, it's a tough political cr climb for that. Uh, we've talked about the advanced biomedical research, advanced manufacturing. We have uh, with uh, a series of universities, we do have one of our innovation hubs. It's in uh, advanced materials. And uh, autonomous vehicles is an area of interest in the engineering school, as long, in addition to obviously clean energy, climate change, and cybersecurity. And then, of course, STEM is, is an area of strength that MSU has led in for, for num a number of years. I'm not going to go into the details, but this will give you a sense of what the, the final numbers, which are those negotiated between the White House and Congress are in the past years, and then how much more a White House asks every, more, every year and then negotiates downwards. There are some bills you'll see, especially in USDA, where the, the ask and the final negotiated amount is the same. And there's NIH, DOD Basic Research, uh, Energy, RPE is that ad advanced cutting edge agency I mentioned, Education. Uh, FRIB is we are a facility that we are building right down the street. It is the first national lab size facility ever being built by a university. It will do world class nuclear physics research. And um, the total amount proposed for the budget is about $740 million. It is There's a request for $100 million for this year. It's the same that was appropriated last year. Uh, after this, uh, the construction cycle starts on a downward trend, so it's about 97.3 is next year's request. Uh, the facility for rare isotope beams is 10 weeks ahead of schedule. 
and it is on budget and is 55% complete. So uh, we are making sure as the first university to get the chance to, uh, to do this that we are going to do it right. And uh, Thomas Glossmacher and his team and all the construction workers who work through the snow uh, should be commended for, for an excellent effort. And then uh, this is just a, a slide giving you a sense of where MSU gets its funding right now. About 30% is from Department of Energy. Much of that is, is DOE. Uh, then NSF has traditionally been a leading area. And uh, Health and Human Services is where NIH comes from. And USAID and uh, agriculture are other traditional areas of strength as well. And uh, that's it. That's all I have. Any questions? Yep. So there was a lot of um, uh, controversy in the sci House Science Committee mm -hmm. about uh, uh, especially social behavioral and uh, economic research in the NSF, mm -hmm. as well as climate change and across a number of agencies, uh, and actually trying to mandate uh, funding decisions. And mm -hmm. What was, I mean, is that, is that a a flash in the pan, that's something we're going to see more of, is going to expand, how is it connected see, to this other effort? Too? Yeah, you will see more of it, and that is the danger and downside of letting Congress get involved in uh, agency priorities for science. The Science Committee, however, is not the Appropriations Committee, and the Appropriations Committee makes the final decisions on funding levels. Um, that said, uh, I think you will see a continued uh, drumbeat uh, against social science research, against clean energy, against climate change. Geosciences. Um, geosciences, yeah. yeah. I guess if we're looking for a bright side, while that seems to be an initiative in the House so far, mm -hmm. not the Senate, it the, is Senate not in the Senate has shown zero interest in taking up that fight. Mm -hmm. That would Sorry. not be my slide. No, but, um, there has been a movement, and this is something that Senator um, Alexander has been interested in, is um, building big uh, bio repositories, um, data collection and management, um, how we're going to continue to support these large databases, particularly the ones that are uh, stored and managed by NIH. Um, that's being squeezed as well, in addition to everything else related to research. Uh, there's also data sharing is becoming a big issue, you know, when, how and when do we mandate that researchers share data, how do we break down the silos that exist in the research community that might prevent data sharing, those kinds of things. So I look at it as sort of a, just the modernization of science, a recognition that the way that we do science today is very different, yet our laws and our regulatory structure does not recognize that at all. Yeah, and there is a big data initiative coming out of the White House, it's about two years old now, I yeah. think. Mm -hmm. uh, I should note two. My office puts out a, about a weekly update called the DC Update. You can find the most recent one on the Federal Affairs website, uh, which is part of the Office of the Vice President for Research's web website. You can also, after this, give me your email, and I can put you on the email distribution list. It comes out pretty late on Friday, but it does list, uh, it gives you a summary of what happened in Washington, and then it gives you a list of news articles and press releases that reflect the priorities of the MSU administration. So, so Jennifer, you, you indicated that there's enthusiasm again this year for NIH. Mm -hmm. But here's the question. How can we get that enthusiasm to spill over to other science agencies? It's tough. It's tough. NSF, it's going to be very tough because we've got a House chair who's out to get NSF. Yeah. Um, DOE, I think there's just probably, in my opinion, you correct me if I'm wrong, just kind of a lack of what, a lack of awareness about what DOE does, um, yeah. why it's important. They see things like you know clean energy research, which is deemed political, but they don't realize what other aspects of DOE. That being said, every member of Congress who lives in a state or a district with a, na a national lab, like Oak Ridge National Laboratory or Brookhaven or Fermi Lab, at least they're somewhat more aware of that because of the employment that those labs provide and the dollars that come into the state or the district. And DOE has so many functions, many of which are not research. So you have the Office of Science, you have EERE, you have ARPA E, you have the nuclear weapons, at, uh, you name it. So, so it's a, it is not a, as clear of an advocacy message as right. NIH. And I think that's NSF suffers from that a little bit as well, too. Mm -hmm. NSF doesn't does pro do a lot of biological research, but people's awareness of it 
not very high. Mm -hmm. And part of it is NSF has a smaller budget. They don't have a, as a robust sort of public affairs mm -hmm. um, staff. Mm -hmm. They're working on that now to sort of do a big initiative that NIH has done over the years to say, this is what NSF research has funded and why it's important mm -hmm. to you. Would advocacy help? There, there are advocacy efforts already yeah. uh, in all, all of these areas. Um, actually, one next week in nuclear physics. We're working with uh, Brookhaven and J Labs just on the nuclear physics part. Uh, there's an NNS, NSF advocacy day that occurs every year. So advocacy, advocacy does help, but these are very tight budget climates. And you know, staff and members, uh, regardless of the politics, they are facing true budget realities, um, and they, they, it's their job to make that all fit. So, uh, basic researcher, <laughs> NIH-funded research work, uh, very well uh, familiar with our society's activities and lobbying for support for basic research coalitions for life science. I think FASF <laughs> is one of the organizations that interacts with that. Um, I was at Purdue last year and was told that faculty there may not identify themselves as Purdue faculty because the administration feels that the federal government spends enough money. Mm -hmm. So messages coming from their university that we should spend more on NIH or whatever were unwelcome. <coughs> what is the MSU policy in that regard? Certainly as, a, as an active researcher, I was uh, flabbergasted I said, this is actually part of our ex expectations that we, as professionals, would put a word in for the kind of work we do. And this was kind of, but I wonder how um, widespread that is, or what is the actual <coughs> every 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 university is different. Um, they all have their own different priorities. Uh, so for MSU, we certainly are, the administration is a strong supporter of NIH, NSF, DOE, uh, NEH, um, all the very important uh, federal research agencies. If you're coming as a member of your society, you are coming as an individual. Uh, we're always proud of our researchers and proud for you to say that you're from MSU, but you need to make sure that you say you are here as a member of a society and representing your own viewpoint. It's just, it actually strengthens the message because Members of Congress, regardless of their political um, leanings, really want to hear from constituents more than anyone else. So to tell them that you took time and money out of your very busy schedule and your own budget to come and advocate for something really sends a message that this is truly important. So, so we're not going to get a pack of MSU lawyers on our back? No, you will get no MSU show lawyers on your back. have a little Sparty Green <laughs> no. uh, lapel pin while we're talking to our representatives. Yes. May I speak? Today? Sure. Um, I can assure you that won't happen. <laughs> These ladies have taken me around the hill for the last five years. I've been going to the hill for the last 25 or 30 years. And I will reinforce what, what Sarah said. They want to hear your story. Um, we were just on the hill last week with Facet Hill Day. And it was, as usual, well, Sue Barman's been there, Barbara Cake's been there for Hill Day. Um, it's a very effective means of getting our message across. And um, our senators, our representatives want to hear what we have to say. So don't underestimate the power of individual advocacy. Like Sarah says, we're there as individuals. We are not there representing MSU. We're not there asking for new buildings. We are there for the bigger picture mm -hmm. of science funding. And, and that's the important message. So, so if, if there were a problem with this, I would have lost my job a long time. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's not in danger. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.